Wait, a tiny bit quieter. <laughs> hey guys, can you guys hear me okay? Let's see. Awesome. Okay, so, and I'm assuming you guys can also see my screen um, right now there should be the get max function so you guys can see the screen too. Very, very nice. So just want to introduce myself first of all and say that it's really nice to meet you guys. My name is David and um, I'll be your instructor for half of this bootcamp prep course. Um, I know you guys have all met Stan um, and so we'll be pairing together to help you guys um, learn the fundamentals of JavaScript. And to tell you a little bit about myself, I went to full stack about two and a half years ago in the 1707 cohort. I graduated and then I stayed after an extra cohort as a teaching fellow because I really enjoyed teaching. Um, and I worked for two years after graduating uh, as a fellow at a company called PaintSend, and I worked in web dev. Um, recently, I just got a job at Spotify um, as a web dev as well. And so, um, yeah, that was really exciting. I have, um, I do this on the side as well because I, as I mentioned earlier, I really enjoy teaching and helping people and so that's why I do this on the side. But yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Um, I guess a fun fact was that in my first job at Pingsen, uh, there was about out of the 20, 20 ish engineers, there was five of us that were from full stack. So it was a really fun time there and um, got to know a lot of people really well by not only learning with them, but also working with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a little background about myself, uh, and just to let you guys know, and at any point, if you guys have any questions, you guys can put it in the chat. I'll try to check it intermittently, or you guys can unmute yourself and just go ahead and shout out, shout it out. Um, and yeah, I can, because this is remote and I still want you guys' input on things, even when I'm going through the lecture, it would be helpful if you guys want to shout things out or if you don't want to put it in the chat, but I'll try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, hmm. What else is there? Yeah, um, I'm sure there will be more things I think of as I go, but yeah, um, feel free to stop me and ask any questions you guys have. But to get on with today's portion, today's lesson, um, first I wanna review the question get max because I believe that was what you guys wanted to see me run through. Um, so yeah, uh, if you guys looked at the solution, I believe the solution has it um, somewhat a complicated approach, which is there's three parameters here. And essentially, it was comparing them all using multiple if statements. Um, so I mean, that there's nothing wrong with that solution, we could say if a is less than b. Um, and then in here, we could say another one saying it's if A is less than C, then, or sorry, we need to get the max. So if A is greater than B, if A is greater than C, 
then that means a is greater than all of them. So we can return a um, uh, else if c is greater. I mean, I'm starting to get a little confused now, but um, because I don't want to go into this sort of nested maze of ifs. Um, and so I think a different approach could be to basically convert. I mean, I don't want to get too, we're going to learn about arrays as we go on to the next um, lectures. And so I think one good way would be to maybe turn this all into an array and then go through the array and then keep track of the max and then update that max. But I mean, we, we'll, we'll learn how to do this um, by going over loops today. But yeah, let's just stick with this if solution for now. But um, it definitely can be a little confusing because of how nested things are. But I guess I can just simplify it and say if a is greater than b and a is greater than c, then return a. Um, or I could say if b is greater than a, there's probably some redundancy here, but I think it is simpler than maybe the first nested solution to follow all that logic. So if b is greater than a and b is greater than c, then return b. Um, and then you can say if uh, c is greater than a and c is greater than b, then return c. Um, I'm not 100% sure how they're handling the edge cases, such as an edge case might be if these are equal, if some of them are equal, then this won't, this solution won't return the correct value because there's a chance that they're equal. Um, but let me just run this and see what we get here. Yeah, so I guess they don't, um, they don't consider the case where they'll, they'll, they're essentially saying that these will never be equal. And that's one of the conditions. And so, yeah, I mean, this is a little redundant. I'm sure there's a simpler way, but I think this is, um, or there's probably a more efficient way, but I think this kind of gets the point across when you're doing multiple comparisons, you can use this ampersand and this will, sh this will say, you know, we'll only go into this if conditional if both of these are true. Um, and I'm just kind of repeating that uh, logic for each variable. Um, and yeah, you could have done it the other way where, with nested conditionals, such as, um, you know, having an if in here. But I think it's a little clearer to have it all in the outer level. So we're not you know, getting too deep in the weeds. And also doing a lot of nested if conditionals can get pretty out of hand. So if you had one here, and then let's say you had another one, you know, in here, then it could quickly get out of hand and get really complicated. So yeah, if, if possible, keeping ifs on the outermost level can be very helpful. Um, I think someone has a comment. So ne no semicolon. So Jackie asked if there's no semicolon needed after the return statement. Um, I believe that having a semicolon is a stylistic, for the most part, is a stylistic choice. So you could have it, um, in this case, you don't have to have it. Um, I believe there's certain edge cases, like if you... I think if you put it on a new line, it'll break without a semicolon. So let me try this. Um, yeah, so this would break. I believe if you add a semicolon though, it, could, it might consider it being on the same line. I'm not 100% sure though. No, it's not. Okay, so yeah, for most, there's like, I believe there's one tiny edge case 
where having a semicolon actually affects the output. But for now, it's not coming to mind. But for the most part, for 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a stylistic choice. And whether or not you put it or not doesn't matter for um, what we return. No problem. So is there, are there any other questions about this particular problem? If not, then we will go through loops and um, at the end, I'll kind of jump the gun a little bit, but we'll approach how we could solve this problem in a even cleaner way, in my opinion, than doing all these conditional checks. Um, but for now, if that's it, then we'll go to the lecture portion of today. And again, feel free to stop me if you guys are confused, if I'm going too slow, too fast, just let me know. And I will do my best to answer your guys' questions. So let's get started. So with loops, Um, we can solve a lot of problems that we encounter on a daily basis. So there are many times where we'll need to go through each item in a list. And so loops really help for that. Um, basically, if you had a list of clothes and you wanted to go through that list and pick out the ones that you're going to take on a vacation, you would need some type of loop to get through to basically check each article of clothing you have. Um, or uh, if you wanted to do something a set amount of times. So if you wanted to make, you know, five eggs, then if you wanted to cook an egg five times, then you could say, you know, repeat cooking one egg, but do that five times so that in the end you have five eggs. Um, so it's really good for repetitive tasks as well. And debugging, um, this is going to help with, um, you know, when we're writing code, majority of the time, the first try, you know, there'll be something wrong, like the test won't pass or you're not getting what a value that you expect. And so debugging really helps figuring with figuring out what went wrong going really in depth and granular into what, what each function is doing and the values of variables at a specific step in the function. And so we'll be able to really discover the error that is throwing off our code. So yeah, this is what we're going to be going over today. The while loop, the for loop, the break and the continue keywords. These are really just core fundamentals that will always be used from you know beginner level all the way to the most advanced levels of uh, programming. And these are just foundational concepts that we'll go over. And then we'll go over debugging um, because it's really, you know, majority of our time is spent not necessarily coding, but also just figuring out why our code isn't passing. And if we wanna shorten that time, then we'll be much more efficient with our time. And so that's sort of the idea for reviewing debugging. So a while loop is a little simpler syntactically than a for loop, but they can pretty be much be used interchangeably. Um, so the while keyword, it's a conditional expression that basically becomes either true or false. And if this conditional statement within the two parentheses is true, it, if it evaluates as true, then we evaluate this block of code. That can be anything. So we could think of something like while season equals winter. And then within that, we could say where jacket. 
And if the season is not winter, then it will never enter into the code that's within the two brackets. So yeah, this conditional statement has to be true. It has to evaluate true. It doesn't have to be true exactly, but it has to somehow evaluate to true in order for us to access the code that's within the brackets. And so it'll constantly run as long as the expression evaluates to true. And so, yeah, we'll think of an, we'll go over an example here. Um, first, we're setting the count to be three and we're saying if the count is greater than or equal to one, then we'll log. So does anybody have any guesses as to what this will, what will happen here? What will be printed to the console? You guys can shout it out or ch put it in the chat or yeah, beautiful. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what will happen. We'll have uh, three, two, and one. Um, and then once we go from one to zero, this expression within the parentheses, the count greater than or equal to one, that's no longer going to be true because it's going to be zero. So it'll technically be less than one. And so we'll just skip that block of code and we'll go to the next like uh, next block of code that's under the while loop. And so, yeah, this is the while loop. Um, you sh it's always tricky that count minus minus on line five. That is something that you always have to do in a while loop is you always have to make sure to get the conditional one step closer to being false because otherwise you'll end up in an endless loop. So if the count minus minus line five wasn't there, this would loop, this would go on forever. And, um, we, our program would break because we would run out of memory because we have a limited amount of memory that we can use. And so if this uses up all that memory, then the program will just crash because there's no more memory um, available. And so yeah, we'll get three, two, one, and then it'll break out. Um, and how about if we use count plus plus? So, that's a good question. If we use count plus plus, then this will always um, also run forever, but we'll basically be logging three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, like all the way until we run out of memory and the program crashes. So, in this case, we have to use minus minus because that is getting the conditional statement within the parentheses one step closer to becoming false um, with each iteration, as opposed to as opposed to not making any progress towards that being false. So in this case, plus plus would result in an endless loop. But good question, and keep the questions coming. Um, is there any way to make it count by a decimal? Uh, yeah, you can definitely do a decimal. You can say, um, so let me just get out of this slides and let's jump into the REPL. So here, Sorry, guys, let's move this in case I needed that. Um, so if we wanted to do decimals, then we could just simply do while, um, you know, we could set I, uh, we could set, you know, my cash to be zero. And we'll say while cash is less than or equal to, or we could say, 
um, let cash equals 100. And then while cash is greater than or equal to zero, um, let's see, console log shop. So you can keep shopping. And then you could say, if you wanted to count by decimal, you can't do this. You have to do minus equals 0 0.1 or something. So like, let's say you're just losing 10 cents each time you shop. And then here, when you're out of money, you got to go get some more money. So you got to work. So you could do something like this, where it'll say, um, it should do a bunch of shops. I think my computer's see not sure what's not why it's not yeah it's just like there's a bunch of um, shops just because I'm only decreasing it by 10 cents each time and then finally when this becomes zero when cash becomes or when cash becomes negative 10 so we're in falling into the negatives now, it'll break out of this loop and then it'll log work. So yeah, you can make it count by however much you want. It just, you can't use this because that is a just, it's just a shortcut for one. And so if you wanted to do your own thing, then you have to do this and then whatever number that you want. So yeah, um, great question. Again, keep the questions coming. So that is the while loop. Let's see. So yeah, while false, um, does anyone have any guesses as to what this will log? Yep, it won't. That is correct. It will never just it won't log anything because it's, it's already false so it'll just skip that while loop so this is kind of the answer is already given here but again while true this is gonna run forever um, but not really forever because eventually the machine will run out of memory and so it'll just crash but this is you know usually we don't make the mistake of creating a while true. That's pretty rare that we ever will write code just that blatantly obvious. Um, but usually we'll put some condition in there and then we'll forget to decrement. Um, so this happens a lot. This happens to me all the time where I'll just forget to do something and then I'll, I'll be doing a bunch of more stuff, like all this complicated stuff. But then at the end, I never, <clears throat> I will forget that I have to get this condition closer to being false at each iteration. So whatever, you know, in this case, it's pretty hard to forget because I'm only doing one thing. But once you start doing multiple things in this while loop, it'll get really complicated and you might forget to, um, you might forget to decrement your, your variable uh, and get it closer to breaking out. So that's something to always keep in mind is try and remember to do something with this conditional statement to make it closer to being false. Yeah, this will break our program. So kind of mentioned this already, we have to, we have to decrement our variable in this case. The cool thing about a for loop is this is handled for you. It requires you to create a decrement or an increment that will break out of the condition. And so it's extra work, but at the same time, it keeps you honest and it prevents these uh, memory overflows from happening because you're forced to, by the signature of the loop, you're forced to create the conditional and you're forced to create an iteration that will get the 
um, conditional closer to being false. So yeah, we have, and again, you can do the same things with each, each loop, but you'll find as you start coding that you, certain situations will be just simpler to use a while loop. Others will be simpler to use a for loop. It'll just be sort of, it'll come as intuition, but if you really wanted to, you could kind of cram either or tool into whatever problem that you encounter that involves iterating. Um, so Elizabeth says that if you don't like while loops and yeah, I mean, for now, you can definitely avoid while loops and just stick to for loops because um, initially I also didn't like while loops because I would always make that mistake of not iterating that variable. And so it's kind of easy to forget, but it would always be good to know and practice both just because even if you don't like writing for loops or while loops, eventually somebody's going to you're going to encounter that in someone else's code and you're going to have to decipher it. And so it will always help to just be good at both things. But for now, um, you can really do most things with a for loop that you, you would need a while loop to do. So for loop, you have an initialization, a condition, and a final expression. Um, yeah, it'll keep running until the condition becomes false. So very similar to while loop. It's just a little more verbose, but it keeps you from um, running into those memory overflows. So yeah, we initialize a variable and before every iteration, we check a condition. If it's true, then it'll the loop will run again. Then after the iteration, the final expression is run, which is usually a plus plus or minus minus, um, as we can see here. So yeah, this pretty much uh, does the same thing as the while loop, um, except this starts at one and then it goes up to three. So it'll be one, two, three. So Cassie asks, what are some real world applications of loops beyond just counting and iterating through a string or an array, or is that the main use? There's just, that's a great question. Um, there's a million uh, use cases for, um, for loops. So one real world application is let's say you're on a um, e-commerce site like Amazon, for example, or some Nike.com or something. And then let's say in the home page you have all these clothes, um, and you have you know like T-shirts one and T-shirt two and shoe one. You just have like a bunch of stuff. Like this is all your stuff. And then when you click men's or when you click shoes, right, um, it should filter and take out all of the other stuff and only show you what you're interested in. So if this is your website, then you have to loop through and say, oh, like, are you a shoe? Like you're asking this element, are you a shoe? No, then I don't care about you. Just stay where you are. Oh, are you a shoe? No, so I don't care about you either. Stay where you are. And then you go here and then you say, oh, are you a shoe? Then um, if you are, let me, let me put you into this new list. And let me only show you this list on, on this computer screen as opposed to showing you everything. So that's one example of when you would need to loop through and do something. Um, what else is there? So yeah, like let's say you buy, you know, um, two tickets or let's say, hmm, 
What's another example of a loop that I can think of off the top of my head? Yeah, I mean, if you needed to do like a set amount of work for each, if you needed to repeat some work, so can't really think of another example off the top of my head, but yeah, this is just one example of loops and iterations where you need to access each item and then you can like do some conditional logic to say, oh, like I want to pick you or I want to leave you where you are and then display something on the screen based on that, um, which is really common for just shopping websites. Yeah. Um, so exactly, that's repeating tasks with various filters and conditions until an end state is reached. That's a very common use case for loops. Um, exactly. And Elizabeth asked, what are some, what about entering a function with a loop? So we'll get, we'll go over functions a little bit later, um, but definitely you can call a function within a loop. So let's say we had a function like, um, you know, uh, show item and this function shows the item, then you could just say, you know, for um, item in close, if item, I'm just doing shortcuts here. Uh, this isn't actual, this may not actually work, but I'm just writing pseudocode because I don't want to take up time and write out the actual syntax. But we could just pretend that this is, well, if we want it to be um, correct, we could say for let i equals zero, i is less than or equal to, or less than close dot length, i plus plus, and then we could say uh, let uh, item equals uh, close i, and then we could say show item item or something. And then in here is some logic to like show some item. And so we could say, <clears throat> oh, like if item equals shoe, then we can call a function show item. So yeah, we can definitely enter a function within a loop. Um, yeah, that is a possibility. Um, but yeah, great questions. Keep them coming. I'm going to go back to the lecture for now. So yeah, we have all these conditions and this will log one, two, three. Um, we can loop in either direction. So this is really useful for, so first of all, what, uh, does anyone want to volunteer what this would log? to this would print out to the console. Basically, awesome. Thank you. It would exactly it would log five, four, three, two, one. And that's because we're going down now, not up. And this is really useful because Let's say you wanted to reverse the string, reverse a string. Um, you could probably, you know, do some employ this strategy where you're going backwards and you're saying, let me start at the last element and then let me like go down until the first element and recreate that string in reverse. And this is really common with a lot of interviewing questions is they'll try to say, oh, you know, like do something in reverse. Um, and so we'll know that we'll start at the top and work our way to the bottom in that case. We can also increment or decrement by any number. So a little less common. Usually we just do increment by one or negative one. 
But you know, in certain cases, you might want to do more than that. So we can we can do that with plus equals whatever number. And that kind of goes back to the earlier question with what if you wanted to have decimals? Well, you can use minus equals or plus equals and increment or decrement by a decimal. So yeah, that is our for loop. It'll be 100, 200, 300. Yeah, we can use our loops to iterate through a string. Any guesses as to what this will log? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Not quite in that order, but in Cassie's order, I believe. Um, yeah, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. This is something that is very commonly done is, you know, going through letters. And a use case of this might be, you know, when you, when a user types in a, on a form, like a name, for example, um, and let's say you wanted to remove all the spaces in that string because the person created extra spaces before they started typing their name, then you need a program that removes all the empty spaces in that string. Well, this is how you would do it, is you would just go through that string and say, if it's an empty space, then don't add it to my new string. But if it isn't, if it's an actual character, then add it to my string and then use that filter, that clean string. Don't use what the user typed in just because anytime you let the user type, there's a lot of mistakes that could happen or inconsistencies. And so there's a lot of code out there that cleans that up and they all use a loop under the hood. So, and they all access, use character access like letters, square bracket, and in order to get the actual character of that string. So yeah, great job. Continue. So continue allows you to basically skip to the next iteration. Um, and so in this case, does anyone have any guesses what this what this will log. Um, three, four, five, that's a good guess. One, two, three, four, five. I think Jessica, Cassie, May, you guys all got the got it correctly. Um, it will skip three because if it hits three it runs continue and that means that none of the code below the continue will run for that iteration it'll just it'll just force the for loop to go to the next iteration and so 3 will be skipped and so we'll have 1 2 4 5 and this is really useful if we want to just make sure that we only want to do things to a certain um to a certain element or item, then this becomes really useful. Um, technically, we could just have said, oh, if, so let's dissect this a little bit. Um, so let me just go to my REPL. And we could just say, um, do the same thing like, Let's just put these. So we can just say for close length item if item equals shoe. We'll just say console log item and yeah, this should log shoe. Um 
But technically, we could have also said if item equals t-shirt, continue. And then here, we could have just put console log item. And in that case, it'll also only um, tell log shoe because when it was a t-shirt, it just continued. But it, if you haven't noticed, it's a little redundant. You don't, a lot of times you can get away with not using a continue by just putting the correct conditional in here that you care about, such as like this, and then actually doing the work within the conditional. And in that case, it's kind of like an implicit continue. Like it'll just continue. If there's nothing else to be done, it'll automatically continue anyways. So you don't have to explicitly tell it to continue because it will just automatically continue as long as this case is still true. But it's always nice to have that escape hatch because when things start getting complicated, it might be helpful to have this continue, not only for its usefulness, but also readability. If somebody else is reading your code and it says continue, then you know that when it hits that, it, it's, not, it's no longer going to look at any code below it. So it's simple. Your eyes see it, and it just you just say in your head that it's going to move on to the next iteration. So it's very clear. It's very helpful to other readers. But sometimes you don't need it because whatever, you know, at the end of your loop body, it doesn't implicit continue. And so, yeah, it'll call it skip. Good job. Is it also helpful having multiple individual conditions in a loop? Um, that's completely fine. I mean, I would say if you need to have multiple conditionals in a loop, um, go for it. It's common. But as I mentioned before, when you start nesting loops deep into each other, it just becomes hard to reason about it's kind of confusing like why there's so many nested ifs when you keep all the ifs in the outermost level it i feel like it's a little more clear like when when all of them are out here if something if something if something then you kind of just linearly go top down and see which conditions are true and then it'll go into that condition but once you start nesting i wouldn't recommend nesting it too deep sometimes you have to nest but if you can avoid it it's really just it's more, it makes the code more simple to understand. And it just helps those that come after you because chances are if you write code, someone else is going to have to read it. And if it's nice and neat, then that person will love you. And so, yeah, you should, we should always try and be as clear, clean as possible. But obviously, there are exceptions. You can't always avoid it. But um, having multiple individual conditions in a loop, that's completely fine. Um, yeah. So yeah, we have that here. We're getting a little, did I skip something here? So looks right. Yeah. So here we have one, two, four, five, and then, yeah, it also works in while loops. So this one's a little trickier. But if you guys want to take a second to try and reason about this, um, in modulo, the parenthesis, um, the um, percent sign just means that when you divide that number by two, there's no remainder. So the remainder is zero. So like two modulo two would be zero. And three modulo two would be one. So yeah, exactly. It would be five, three, one, essentially counting all the odds, just because if the number is even, then you just continue. Um, but first you have to decrement the count. So always have to remember to decrement the count to make the 
expression um, closer to being false. I would argue that you wouldn't really need a continue here. You can make it really simpler by doing something like, um, if you wanted to have an odd counter, say count equals five and then while count is uh, greater than zero. Um, if count modulo two does not equal to zero, console log count. And technically this should give you, oh, see, like I forgot it again. Um, I always do that and yeah, so yeah, I'm not sure why it's counting one twice, but count is less than two, comes a lot of count. That's weird. But you guys kind of get the idea. Um, I can look into why it's doing that. What if it's less than, it's greater than zero. Yeah, let me look into that, but you guys get the idea that basically you there's an implicit continue here. So we can skip it, but we can also use it um, if we want it to be explicit. So we have some questions. Is continue used a lot in the real world? Seems like you can always do without it. Yeah, I don't see it's not common. It's not common, but it exists and sometimes you see it so but like, as i've shown you before it's a lot less code to like just skip it and just only do your work if um if uh yeah um can we use modulo three equals zero I think modulo three doesn't necessarily mean that it's odd. Um, there's a remainder in, oh, are, are we trying to solve this one thing? Let me, let me try to setting it equal to one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why. So in this case, I would maybe console log count just to see what it is at each step. So if it's five, it's five, if it's three, it's three. If it's two, um, we don't do anything. And then if it's one, then we log one and then we log one again. There's something else in this code, it's weird. count console log so what would happen if you didn't decrement before the continue in that previous example okay so let me go to the previous example I'll figure this out I'm not sure why it's logging one twice um, because here when count is one, we log one, and then I'm not sure where that phantom log is coming from. It's a little odd, but let me go back to the slides and then answer that question. So in this case, if we didn't decrement before the continue, yeah, it would, um, it would, so if we didn't decrement, it would crash because we would have log, I mean, we would have five and five is, five modulo two does not equal zero. So it would console log five and then it would go to four. And then once it's four, it'll do four modulo two and that equals zero. So it'll, um, if we don't decrement it and we just continue, then that count will stay at four It'll just it'll just constantly uh, repeat this block forever until uh, we run out of memory. 
So yeah, it would it would break. This, however, is tricky, and I'm very confused why it logs one twice. Um, because we can see that once it, so once the count is one, it logs, it goes in here and it logs count, it logs one, and then it should decrement, and then it never goes back in again because it's zero. So we never see count zero, so it's not like it's it can even go back in to here. Um, yeah, this is some weird, some weird behavior. Let's see. Uh, one. Let me try this. So now it should go in. Yeah, that is really odd. And I can't explain it why that's happening. But now it'll work because, or now, I mean, it'll log like zero modulo two, I guess, is equal to one. So that's, yeah, I'm not sure why it's logging that last. Because when zero, when count is zero, zero modulo two does not equal one, but it's still logging zero. Hmm. That's zero, it shouldn't even go in here. So. Yeah, I think this might be like a REPL issue because we have count five, count inside is five, count three, count inside is three, count one, count inside is one, count zero, but it's still log zero. So it doesn't it doesn't go inside of here. So it's not logging this, it's just logging some implicit log. I'm not sure. This might be some REPL thing, but this was a good example of how we could debug things. So we could use debugger in this case, and we'll go over that later. But the easiest thing sometimes is just to throw some console logs in and see what our intermediate values are so that we can debug and figure out what's happening. So yeah, there we are with continue. Break is actually used more commonly. And break basically breaks out of the loop. And what's great about this is that it saves you from doing unnecessary work. So let's say you want to find the first um, sweater in your list and only the first sweater. Then you could say, go through the entire list. But if you find that sweater, break break the loop. So it saves you from doing extra work. Does anyone want to take a guess at what this would, um, this would print to the console? Yep, A++, beautiful. So once it hits a certain length, then we break. So this is why we can use while true. It's because we essentially the if conditional is our breakout case. And so we, we are getting closer to that um, with each iteration by adding plus to migrate. So yeah, this is actually much more common than continue because as we've seen before, continue, it can you can kind of finagle your way into not using a continue. But for breaks, um, you have to tell it to once it accomplishes your task or finds what you're looking for, don't keep searching. And so break is a lot more common. 
You can also do it in for loops. I accidentally went a little too fast, but as you can see here, we don't go all the way to one, even though our conditional is i is greater than or equal to one. We only go till seven and then we break. So it saves the computer from doing extra work. And whenever you can save work, you should always try to do that because it'll make your program run faster. So yeah, we've pretty much covered loops. Um, are there any questions about loops? I think it's one of those things that when you look at it, uh, it may seem very intuitive. It may not seem very intuitive, but um, a lot of practice will definitely help with really grasping loops and iterations. And so, yeah, um, we'll go over some problems together and really hammer home these concepts. Uh, but yeah, we'll go into debugging now. So this, I'll share with you guys some techniques to how to quickly debug. Um, you guys just saw an example of that with me using console logs, which is, I would say, very, very common. But you could also use a debugger if you want to be fancy. So let's start with some debugging um, tools. So we'll see this a lot in our exercises. And once we see an error that says reference error, something is not defined, that usually means that you're trying to operate on a variable that hasn't been it's that hasn't been instantiated yet or that hasn't been declared or hasn't been given a value so um when you try to do something like let count and if you do count minus minus Something should break, or it's giving you not a number. But let's just not even do count. Let's not even instantiate it, and let's just try to do uh, yeah, it's saying reference error count is not defined. So we can't access something unless we've already defined it. And so when we do this, basically count is going to be undefined, I believe. So count is undefined, and I'm not sure why I tried to do this. Um, I mean, I'm trying to do something, I'm trying to operate on an undefined, I guess it's giving me not a number, but um, yeah, you can't really do operators like this on something that's undefined. So you'd have to give it a value first. But <clears throat> this is a, a common error that happens when you try to do something with a variable that hasn't been declared. Let's see. So notice the stack, tr stack trace below the error. So if you look at the reference error, sum is not defined. If you look below that, it'll tell you usually where in the code that error happened. So this is also very helpful. It's not always accurate, just given the how all the code is interconnected and how each function might call a different function um, and the way that the engine handles these function calls. Sometimes it may not be completely accurate, but it's at least a good place to start looking. Um, yeah, when a test is failing, 
It's pretty self-explanatory. Usually it tells us what is expected and what we have, and that'll give us a starting point to start figuring out where we went wrong in our code. So yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory stuff. Um, if something is undefined, if it's saying that something is undefined, then it's a great uh, it's a great indicator that something is not returning. So let's say we had a function called sum, and that takes two numbers, and then we do um, we just start console logging it, but we never return it. Then let's say we try to say we try to say let um, sum of uh, I'll give it a different name. What do you guys think this um, will return? Any guesses what this will return? Or what this will what this will print to the to the console? A, B, good guess, three, good guess. It will be, I love the, the attempts. Um, it's definitely a trick, but uh, usually it, it will return undefined because we never returned anything. This is really common. Um, that's kind of like what this is pointing at. Whenever you say, whenever you see a test and it says expected undefined to equal something, that usually means that you're not returning from your function. And so when you don't return anything from a function and you try to set a variable to be equal to whatever this function's invocation is, then it's always gonna be undefined, no matter what you do here. You can do whatever you want in here. You could do really complicated things, but if you don't return, then it'll always be undefined. So if we wanted to actually have it be three, then we would just return a plus b, and then that would make our sum be three. But yeah, that was good guesses. This is a trick, tricky nuance to JavaScript, but that's a very common problem is that you start doing all this work and then your tests call your function and expect your function's value to equal something. But if you don't return, then it will always be undefined. So yeah, um, and now it can also help to look at the code that defines how the test is supposed to work. So yeah, it's always good to look at the tests and try and figure out what the tests are saying. Um, so yeah, just an example, get max. You know, we're we're calling this get max function. The get max is returning values. So it expects this to be a number, and that's true because get max of one, two, three is going to be three. That's a number. It's good to read these tests, and thankfully, these tests are written in plain English, and so we can reason about them pretty pretty easily. So here, this test is saying it's storing the value of this function. So whatever is returned from this function, it's storing it in result, and it's expecting result to equal thirty, and that should be true too. So it's, yeah, it's good to just look over the test and like figure out what the test is actually saying and try and um, to try and get your function to pass the tests. So yeah, that's that's that. Uh, so we have our debugger. 
and debugger is really useful for basically um, figuring out, essentially it, it, it's kind of like what I used before with console logs, but it tells you at each step of the function what um, the values of all the intermediate variables are. So an example of this is I could say, I could put a debugger here. I don't think I need a semicolon. Um, and then if you hit um, right click the, uh, the browser and then hit inspect, you'll get this developer tool right here that pops out and you can go to the console and you can clear the console by hitting this there's any junk that you don't want to cloud your vision. And when you run it, now we're in the debugger and we can see basically it'll show you like step-by-step step what the engine is doing when it executes your function. And so what's cool is that it tells you what the values are, but you could do this with console log too. Um, it's a little less, I mean, sometimes it's quicker to use console logs to see what these intermediate values are, but the debugger is nice because it shows you each one of the values without you having to type in console log, blah, blah, blah. It tells you what all the values are at that, at that point in time, and it tells you where in the code that it's evaluating. And then when you hit stat, this right little arrow right here, I know everything's tiny, but it'll go to the next step. So it'll say, oh, like if A is greater than B and A is greater than C, well, that's not true. So it'll go to the next if. Um, and if B is greater than A and B is greater than C, well, that's also not true. So it'll go to the next if. And if C is greater than A and C is greater than B, that is true. So it'll return C. Yeah, and then it start, it's starting to evaluate the test specs, but once you get here, it's kind of has served its purpose. So yeah, you can throw a debugger and your JavaScript engine will just start um, debugging for you and telling you all those intermediate values, which is pretty nice. So yeah, that is the debugger. Um, kind of went over this already. You can use it in VS Code too. And that's, VS Code is basically, you're not gonna really need it until you start full stack or you start creating your own um, applications. But if you want help in setting up your VS Code or you wanna use VS Code, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and the debugger there works similarly um, as the one that I just showed you guys, but there can be some nuances. So um, yeah, you guys can feel free to reach out if you guys want to use the debugger in VS Code, but you can also just run your code in our browser environment, in our testing environment, um, and you'll be completely fine for now. So yeah, this is how we debug in VS Code. And yeah, that is pretty much it for today's lecture on loops and debugging. Um, are there any questions whatsoever? Um, is there anything that uh, anyone's curious about? If not, then let me just quickly go over that initial get max function. Here we could just, instead of doing all these ifs, oh snap. Um, let's get rid of this. We could, and we haven't learned arrays yet, so 
Um, don't worry if this is confusing because we're going to get to arrays. But basically, we could say, oh, um, I think it's arguments. And that just gives you an array of all these arguments. And then you could just use a loop and say, let max equals, um, let's just start it at 0. And then we could just say for let i equals 0, i is, I is less than arguments.length, i plus plus. And then, does anybody have any guesses as to how, what kind of logic I would have to employ for this? So we'll just say that numbers is an array that has 10, 20, and 30. And so does anybody have any guesses as to how we could get the max um, by using this loop? Yep, perfect. So we could say, we could be really clear and say current number is arguments at i. If numbers i is greater than numbers i plus one, that's a good that's a good guess. But I would say that um, we need to compare it to the max. We need to compare the current number to the max because if we're just comparing it to the one right next to it, then it wouldn't work if it was um, like 30, 10, and 20. Um, then if we did, if we only compared it to the ones next to each other, then we could say, oh, is 30 greater than this? But then we could say, oh, is this greater than, or is 20 greater than 10? So then 20 would be the max. So that's a, that's a, that's a definitely a, a good guess, but um, we would want to compare it to the max because um, at each iteration because there's no guarantee that the numbers will be right next to each other. Like it could just be like in some crazy order, um, like something like this. And so if we wanted the max, then we would, um, want to always compare with the max. Yeah, with a nested, if we if we get when we get to nested loops, um, there, you could probably use that logic. Yeah, you could definitely use that logic with a nested loop. It's a good call out. Um, but here we could just say, you know, if max is greater than, um, or if current number is greater than the max, current number or max equals current number. And in the end, we just return max. Let's try this out. Or let me see. Numbers. Numbers. Expect zero to equal negative hundred. Oh, returns a third number if it is largest. Um, wait, let me see. Returns third number if it's the largest. Yeah. So arguments. Uh, let me go into. A little so basically it's how um, you can get an array of like it turns this into an array like all of your inputs it turns it into an array so you can access um, specific index of it um, it's pretty useful to convert this list into an array that we can use um, I'm not sure why this is failing. Expected zero to equal negative 100. Um, because I'm not sure why, how negative 100 is greater than 
zero. But let's just log this out. So negative 300 and negative 200. Oh, because, so my max has to be like negative a million or something, because it can be negative numbers. So yeah, the, the I think for these kinds of situations, um, it's, there's like, um, You can use something like max integer or something that basically gives you the biggest number and then you can like put a negative in front of it if you don't want to just put like an arbitrary negative number that is represents like the minimum. Um, but yeah, this is just one way that essentially what this will do is if the number is, um, let's say it's, let's say the arguments are one, five and three it'll say oh the max is negative negative something for now um that's what it defaults to and then the current number is going to be one so is one greater than the max theoretically everything should any number should be greater than this so it'll be true so max will become max will be one for now because we haven't gone through the other ones yet and then we'll go to five. I uh, current number will be five. Is five greater than the max? The current max is one right now. So yeah, five is greater. So max will become five. And then we'll go to three. The current number will be three. Is three greater than the max? It's not greater. So it'll just, it won't run this and it'll just break out of the loop and then we'll return five. So I think that's a little bit more if we do it this way, technically we can have like as many arguments as we want. Whereas like before in the old way that we did it, we could only, we were kind of constricted. We could only compare three inputs, but if we wanted to compare more, then this would be able to do that um, because we're just going through and repeating this set of work for each um, element. And I would, I would argue that this is a little more reusable, but I just wanted to show an application of this for loop. Um, and yeah. Um, is there any way to say as many arguments as you want when invoking a function? Yeah, so I mean, you can say something like, this is a little more advanced, but I mean, technically you could just say, um, Let's, I think you can use a spread operator. So that's a great question. Um, this is a little more, we'll learn this later, but I believe if you do something like args, then when you access it here, I believe it's an array. So let me try this. Yeah. So, um, this just means there's arbitrary there's an arbitrary number of arguments. Like it can take one or two or three or four or five, it doesn't matter. And um let me see what the console is. Yeah. So args because so we don't even need arguments. So args becomes an array of whatever number of things you pass into it. So this is a little more advanced, but for example, like get max of one, two, three, um, args is gonna be equal to one, two, three. And if you put four, then it's gonna be four. So it's like very flexible and you're not constrained 
by variables because if you use dot dot dot, it just means that um, you can input however it's like a, a variable amount of um, inputs. But yeah, if this is confusing, don't don't worry. Um, we're just here to focus on loops today, so uh, yeah. If this doesn't make sense for now, don't worry about it. This is we'll we'll get to that in a later lecture. Um, but yeah, are there any other questions? If not, then we can pair off and I'll put you guys into uh, break rooms and I'll be around for any questions that you guys have until 940. Um, and I can also go over some questions at around 920, 915. Uh, so I believe, let me just, uh, turn on the workshop so you guys should be able to see the workshop now um, but yeah there's definitely a lot of questions uh, and so I can you know I, I want you guys to really work through these together and um, at the end feel free to if you guys um, don't want to it's fine but um, at around 9, 10 ish, I can start going over some of the problems and answer any specific questions that you guys have. I mean, I can answer it before that too, but um, I can do a little bit of review so that tomorrow um, Stan won't have to go over like all the questions. If you guys have questions on all of them, I can go over a couple of the beginning ones and then maybe some of the later ones Stan can go over when I create that poll. So yeah, let me just create some pairs and pair you guys off. Give me one sec. 